Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we are continuing the unit tier list series for all the Han units in Total War Three Kingdoms with all the green or poarm units. This tier list follows the heels of our blue unit tier list, so if you missed out on that one, there will be a link in the description below to that video, as well as a playlist to all the tier list videos on the channel. Now, as we continue our series color by color, to cover the best in-class units of each type, we will run into some issues where certain colors, such as yellow, will only end up having five different units, which makes for a rather poor tier list, especially when we consider the fact that we are ranking these into five different tiers, ranging from the godly S tier to the dumpster fire D tier. In the case of green or poarm units, there are 10 different units, and compare that to the 16 different units of the blue or range variety featured in our last tier list, it is a little lacking. But to make up for this lack of units, we will dive a little deeper into the topic of army composition and explore which classes of generals are the best ones to recruit these green or poarm units. Now, this was not a topic in our blue unit tier list because blue generals or strategists in the game have cunning as their base primary stat, which inherently boosts ammo count. And if you add on the fact that blue units also have great skill tree synergies with strategists, it is a no-brainer that 99% of the time you want to recruit your blue units on your blue generals. But this is not the case for green units. The primary stat of all green generals or champions in the game is Resolve, which provides a percentage bonus to the general's own health pool and a population growth bonus if the champion also happens to be one of your administrators. Neither one of these bonuses are relevant for the retinues that they will recruit. And if we take a look at the champion skill tree for any retinue bonuses, we can find only two skills in trust and mobility that will boost all spear infantry armor by 10% and all units battle running speed by 25%. And that's it. So champions don't actually add much value to their own retinues, especially if you compare them to purple generals or sentinels which have three skills in their skill tree that provides own retinue bonuses in bravery, intensity, and composure, which will provide their retinues with charge negate, 25 points of charge speed, and fire arrows. Well, what does all this mean? This means we need to expand our horizon beyond simple color matching when recruiting our retinues as sometime Mixing retinues of different colors can have amazing results, as we will now jump into game to take a detailed look at all 10 of these units to provide an overview before coming back to this tier list here to provide our final rankings. So let's hop into game. Alrighty, so here we are in game in a custom battle where we are showcasing all these units and we have recruited multiple copies of these units. As we can see here, first we have 9 of the 10 units recruited on a champion of our choice, in this case Guan Yu, as his skill tree is pretty regular in terms of retinue bonuses compared to a generic champion, and we decided to use the same general for the units, therefore we don't have the general stat changing any of the actual values for the units themselves. Then we have a 10th unit that's missing from Guan Yu, and that is the Imperial unit here in the Imperial Gate Guards. And the reason for that is Imperial units are only allowed on certain generals such as He Jin in custom battle. So we can only put him here and we'll talk about what some of the difference might be if we could recruit him in game on generals such as Guan Yu. Then we place all the units that could be recruited by a Sentinel on He Jin as well with the exception of Azor Dragons, which in custom battle are restricted only to champions. Dragon units somehow can only be recruited by the general of their color in custom battles, when in fact in campaign, you can have them on generals of any class if you have their reform unlocked. In addition to that, we also chose to use the commander class using Liu Bei as the proxy to recruit four units that could be recruited on them, of course, once again, the only one missing is going to be the Zor Dragon from the Dragon units, 
and the Imperial units, which are only available on Hezin here. So with that in mind, let's start kicking things off with the four exclusive champion units, starting with the Peasant Band. So hopping over here, Peasant Band are the cheapest polearm unit in the game. They do, however, require a reform to unlock, but the reform that will unlock them is only two reforms deep on the reform tree, which means it will take you about 10 turns of investment to get these units. And if we take a look at them, they have very interesting weapons in the game. You see some glaive and some spears, and they represent these expendable units that you can use as the cheapest form of anti-cavalry, and that's where they excel. Because if you take a good look at the stat, nothing really stands out. Low morale, low charge, low attack rate, very very high armor piercing damage, which is surprising, but also very low evasion and very low armor. Decent speed, so on the surface you might think these might be great charging units, but I would argue that because the melee charge bonus is so low, that's actually not the best way to utilize them, as one of the key tenets of all these polearm units in the game is that they will all come inherently with charge reflection versus mounted. But this bonus is only active when you're braced, which means you have to be stationary and facing the enemy cavalry. So one of the major uses of all 10 of these units is to counter the enemy cavalry, as charge reflection will bounce the enemy charge bonus right back to themselves, causing them to take massive damage when they charge into you. Now in the same light, you will still be taking on the blunt of the charge. Both of you will get hurt. So in that case, Peasant Band with their low stat will take a lot of damage and essentially suicide themselves together against the enemy cavalry if you use them in that manner. Now they're not terrible units because of their cheap price. You can utilize them for their high armor piercing damage against enemy armored units in the late game even if you could provide them a very safe flank where they are not taking on the blunt of the enemy charge as they are very fragile. So you have to find a very careful usage for them and you pretty much have to be very poor to default back into them. And speaking of units of this type, we'll talk about the Spear Warriors next as they are the natural progression of the Peasant Band. These units, as you can see visually, have a bit more armor and we're not kidding here as they have 42 versus the 17 here. And one thing to make note is that because Guan Yu is a champion, all retinues of his, if they are spear unit, and here the term spear is used very loosely as the game really means poarm unit, as Ji is a variation of a spear. So in this case, they're all receiving the trust ability or 10% extra armor because otherwise, these peasant band actually only have 7% armor, and the spear warriors will only have 32% armor. But because they're under the command of a champion, they have 10% extra armor. So spear warriors, if you take a look, have higher stats than their peasant band counterparts, as they have higher morale, higher charge bonus, and higher armor. Now this charge bonus difference is actually huge. Going from 21 to 77 is a massive jump for infantry units, and this is the last bit of saving grace for spear warriors, as they can be turned into highly offensive glass cannon chargers given their extremely high armor piercing damage and very high melee charge bonus. For comparison's sake, cavalry units that are of the melee variety, which is known for a slightly lower melee charge bonus, only have around 100 to 150 charge bonus. So having 77 on a melee infantry unit is actually quite high. So keep that in mind as we explore other units of this type. Now of course, using them as a charging unit does have some pitfalls, as if you have them on the move, you will lose the charge reflection, which require you to be braced. In addition to that, this unit, being an upgraded variety of a peasant band, they have access to formations, which you can see here. Peasant band has no formations. Over here, we have access to two different ones. 
one being a spear wall, which we can check out here, is pretty much what the name suggests. You form a wall of spears. It gives you a 1,900% charge resistance. Now, what does charge resistant mean? It means you will take less damage from enemy charge bonus. So you will still reflect their original damage back onto them, but you will take less because you have an increase to charge resistance. In addition to that, you will gain 10% extra melee evasion to make you sturdier in battle, and you will lose 100% range block chance as you are now more clustered up. This is not a problem for this unit here, as we start out with 0% range block chance, so losing 100% here is not actually going to hurt us. We also gain charge reflector, which is quite interesting, as you see we always have charge reflection. What this means here is even if you are moving, you can still have charge reflection on the enemy. Now of course that mobility will take a hit as you can no longer run, as you can only walk with this unit. So it's a great way to slowly move up to moving cavalrys who could pick you off if you were not in this formation. Because if you're just standing in a regular formation here and you're trying to move into a position to stop enemy cavalry and they hit you before you come to a full stop, you're not considered braced and you will not reflect that damage back onto the enemy. But if you've been moving them in a spear wall formation, even though you'll be moving quite slowly, as long as the enemy cavalry are charging you head on rather than flanking from behind, you will apply the same charge reflection back onto them. In addition to access to spear wall, you also have access to hollowed square, which is a unique formation for all non-shielded spear units. And here we can see that like the name suggests, we pretty much become a square with spears pointing in all four directions. And the purpose of formations like this is to obviously protect the center and also to occupy a huge area where the enemy could come from any side as you are now protected on all four directions from enemy charge, whereas in the spear wall, the charge reflection will only be applied to the front. So this is a big change. Now, of course, you lose all mobility while maintaining the hollow square. So the best usage of this is to find a narrow choke point, set this up and block the enemy from maneuvering past you. And that's pretty much the only use of this. It's very useful on the flanks as the enemy have a hard time getting around this formation. Moving on, we have two other units that are unique to champions and can only be recruited by them. And they are the Heavy Z Infantry, which is the most advanced form of Z Infantry in the game. As you can see, they're decked out in armor with 63% armor. Now, you have to subtract 10 to get their base armor stat because once again, we have the trust ability applied on them. In addition to that, you see we have 41 morale, which is decent, 38 charge, which is much lower than the charge bonus we had on the spear warriors, but that is to be expected, as these units are not meant to charge into enemies, and infantry themselves tend to have lower charge to begin with. They have a pretty good mix of damage at 23 base, 28 armor piercing, also pretty low attack rate at 20, but this is expected for all poorm units as they're not meant to be offensive juggernauts. They're designed to be defensive units with charge reflection. They also have the same access to the same two formations. And in general, they're just going to be sturdier varieties of poorm unit that you could employ against enemy cavalry. The high armor can make them a bit better against enemy archers, which have base damage versus armor piercing damage of the crossbow variety, and since all these units do not have shield, they all have 0% range block chance which makes them quite vulnerable to enemy range and it's one of their biggest weakness. And moving on beyond these units, we have the heavy spear guards which are displayed here. Now the first thing you will notice is these guys have a giant shield, and that's really what separates them as they have also very high morale very low melee charge bonus, much lower damage because their spear is a one-handed short spear. But the saving grace here is at least most of the damage are on the armor piercing side, so that will still be a bit better than the distribution on the base. In addition to that, our shield gives us additional shield melee evasion if we're facing the front, as well as additional shield armor of 20%. Now, our total armor 
from the base armor of what we're wearing is only at 42% or 32% to be exact, the 10% boost, which put us in the same range as spear warriors. So it's not very high armor. We get most of our armor from the shield. These two are added together. But if we're faced off against the axe unit, axes will take away 35% from both your shield evasion and your shield armor. So that will strip us of both of these stats and make us actually quite weak because we'll be pretty much comparable to a spear warrior if you think about it that way. And you don't want to get flanked because when you're flanked these bonuses go away as well. But our saving grace is we have 60% range block chance thanks to these giant shields of ours. In addition to that, shielded units have access to different formations to their non-shielded counterpart in that we have a shield wall rather than a spear wall and this gives us a similar set of bonus to spear wall in that it will increase our charge resistance although not as high since we are not really holding long spears we gain additional 15 percent range block chance rather than losing it entirely for clustering up as our shield will help us block more arrows this will push our range block chance to 75 percent which is very very high in the game and it will add 10% extra melee evasion to shield. So this 15% we see here will go up to 25%, which will still be stripped away entirely if we are under attack by an axe unit. So that is something to keep in mind. You can still move in this formation and still have access to charge reflector, but you cannot run. And then a different formation that we have access to is called turtle. Turtle covers up this entire unit with the shield, giving us additional 100% range block chance, which will actually put us over to 160%. At that point, we become invincible to range attack, and on hard, very hard and legendary difficulties, the enemy range unit will simply not shoot at you. Now of course, their artillery and towers will still fire at you. Artilleries will still hurt you, but tower arrows will do no damage to you. So turtle formation is a great way to capture enemy towers and move into enemy tower range as the first unit as the tower will focus fire on you, allowing your other units to move through unharmed. And the only drawback of this formation is you will lose melee attack rate as most of your unit are not here to attack. You have to hold the shield at certain angles and you cannot run. So it's a very slow moving formation. It is still very good. And moving on, we have access to a different variety of the hollow square in that we can form a circle. And the circle pretty much allow us to increase our range block chance by 25%, which is the largest amount we have seen so far, putting us at 85% range block chance. And it will give us 500% charge resistance, 25% melee evasion. We will once again lose melee attack rate and become immobilized. Now this is actually kind of a blessing because immobilize means we'll always have charge reflection as we are always braced and this is probably the best formation to counter cavalry as the other two formations there are really designed to counter range. Of course the shield wall is obviously another choice we can use as a mobile counter to enemy cavalry but I believe circle similar to the hollow square can occupy certain areas of the map and prevent the enemy cavalry from flanking you, making them very valuable in your army. Now, of course, these formations are not great against enemy infantry, and as you might have noticed from the shield units in general, we tend to lose a lot of melee attack rate no matter which formation we take. And we also have lower attack in general because we hold only a one-handed spear versus a two-handed G or two-handed spear of the other varieties. So they're clearly designed as defensive units. And moving on, aside from these four unique champion exclusive units, we have five more units here which we can take a look at. First under a champion, then under a sentinel, then under a commander, just to see the key differences. So starting with champions, which are green generals designed to color code match, we have the Z militia over here. Now these are the most simple variety of pull arm units that's available for all general classes from the onset of the game. They are rather cheap and they're designed to be the sturdy front line as well as flank protectors even though their biggest weakness is their lack of range block chance. So if the enemy have a lot of range units, it will be very hard to keep these guys on your front line as they will get shredded. 
Now, what you want to do with them is obviously have them on your flank to trade into enemy cavalry by applying your charge reflection. So you don't really need them for mobility or for charge, which they don't have very much charge bonus. They have decent armor. Now you have to subtract 10% once you strip away the ability from the champion class, because we can see that pretty visibly once we move to a sentinel class, it goes to 20% here. And if we go to a commander class, it also goes to 20%. So we're getting that trust bonus over here. And that's one of the advantages of recruiting these units on your champions. And moving on, we have a very advanced unit in the Protectors of Heaven. Now, the key thing about these units, aside from how amazing they look and how high-end they appear, is that they become available to you once you reach the King rank, which is a rather easy unlock in my opinion. And because they are so easily unlocked in the natural progressions of a game, it makes them really, really strong. And you can see they have extremely high morale. They have pretty much the same charge bonus as a melee cavalry unit. They have a good mixture of high base damage and decently high armor piercing at a very fast melee attack rate. They have 51% melee evasion base, 63% with the 10% bonus for armor, and 35% range block chance even though they don't carry a shield, which makes them pretty amazing. Decent speed, in addition to that, they are also immune to scare while causing scare themselves, which applies a morale shock to nearby enemies, and they have the same charge reflection. So they're a very powerful unit. They have the same exact set of formations as a basic spear unit, since they don't have shield, and they're probably one of the best units you have available as a polearm unit in the game. Moving on, we have a basic version of the heavy spear guard in the spear guard. You have access to them a bit earlier as you don't have as many requirements in terms of rank compared to the heavy spear guards. They're just slightly worse in terms of range block chance, in terms of their armor, their evasion, their charge. Same damage, they're holding the same one-handed spear and a little less morale. And they would have the same formations. And then moving on, we have the Z Infantry, which is the middle variant between a Z Militia, Z Infantry, and Heavy Z Infantry. We already seen the Z Militia and the Heavy Z Infantry. This is the middle ground. You have medium amount of armor. You have a medium amount of morale. Same low damage and same weapon, as these units tend to share the same weapon with just variations in morale and armor. Then finally, Moving on to the Zor Dragons. This is a very special unit. They require the same reform as the Imperial Gate Guards, which we'll see very shortly. They are very specialized in this group as they are dual weapon. They hold a bow as well as a two-handed glaive. So in essence, if you look at the melee component, they're very similar to a unit we just seen in the Protector of Heavens. Slightly less melee evasion, and less damage in terms of how much they can deal, and definitely less melee attack rate, and about half the melee charge bonus, but roughly the same morale and exactly same armor. In addition, they make up for their lack of other stats in melee by having a bow that they can fire, and they have a very low range attack rate compared to standard archers, which can reach all the way up to about 15 attack rate, now, of course, you can recruit them on other generals that can boost range attack rate, but just looking at the base value, they fire slightly faster than a crossbow, which is definitely slow for archer unit, but they kind of make up for this by having low ammo, which I know is not a great thing, but this means you'll be running out of ammo about the same rate as you would otherwise, so you can get your maximum range damage out a bit earlier. Speaking of range damage, however, they have very high range damage. 40 base, 26 armor piercing. That's slightly lower than Onyx Dragons, but way higher than Archers. So they are very powerful in terms of how much range damage they can do. However, they can only shoot up to 200 range, which is definitely not as good as Onyx Dragons. So they pretty much are not as skilled in terms of their archery skills 
judging by their attack rate and the range, and they don't have as much ammo, but every ammo they have do count as they do a ton of damage. And to facilitate their range attack, you have a couple of different things available to you. One is this new formation called Mixed Spears, which takes away from Spear Wall, which you see is evidently missing here. Mixed Spears mixes up your unit where the front half becomes a Spear Wall, while the back half will fire range. So why is this crucial? As you could have them just all stand here with both the range fire well and the melee both turn on, and they will fire until enemy engage and then they will turn to melee. Well, the key difference here is if you have mixed spear activated, then you become immobilized, which means the front units will have charge reflector and charge reflection at the same time since you're immobilized anyway, so charge reflection is applied. But what's cool about this is once you're engaged in melee, the unit at the back here will remain ranged. Whereas if you don't have this formation on, once one unit enter melee, everyone will enter melee, even though you could technically have a few just engage in melee while freeing up the army behind to continue to fire. So that's the key variation here for Mixed Spear. And it's unique to them because they're a dual weapon. And they can also have access to fire arrows if the general that has control of them, their retinue general, have access to fire arrows, which in this case is a custom battle issue as typically champions don't have access to the composure skill which gives them fire arrows. So this is just something that's breaking the rule here in custom battles. Typically you only find composure on sentinels, commanders, and strategists, which all can recruit Azure Dragons as they are one of the dragon units. So that's all the champion retinues. We'll move on to the variants of the sentinel just to compare the key differences. And looking at a Z Militia, the key difference in stat obviously is the 10% armor that's missing. But what you get instead is a change to their bonuses here with something called Charge Negation. Charge Negation negates the charge bonus of the attacker. And this can be combined with Charge Reflection. And what I mean by that is if you have Charge Negation and Charge Reflection, you not only will reflect back the full damage of the charge to the unit that's charging you, you will also take zero damage from the charge. So whereas if you have a standard D militia sitting on your back line protecting your flank, enemy cataphract comes in with a heavy charge, sure, you will inflict massive damage back to that cataphract unit, but you will tend to rout as well, as you will also take massive amount of charge damage from them. So in a sense, you're trading a low value unit with the high value unit of your enemy. And even if the enemy is using militia units, having a Z militia to trade into that is excellent because militia cavalries cost much more than militia infantry. And in the case, if you have them on a sentinel, then you can gain access to charge negation if the sentinel has the bravery skill picked up. And that's pretty key as then you can trade a very simple Z Militia into a very expensive Cataphract and take zero damage from that charge while reflecting their massive charge right back on them. So that's very key and that's a very cool combination you can utilize with your Sentinel Generals by recruiting certain polearm units on them. But there is one additional drawback that you have to pay attention to is that there is no boost to battle speed on sentinels where there is on champions so you see 48 base speed versus 38 now this might not be a big issue for z militia as you don't intend to use them for charge and even if you do want to use charge there is still the intensity skill on the sentinel tree that gives you 25 charge speed meaning additional speed when you're charging so they will even out when you charge but you probably don't want to charge with Z Militias in the first place with their 21 charge bonus. However, that will change if you look at Protector of Heaven. Now, once again, the difference will be the speed and the armor from the skill, and the extra bonus is the charge negation that will be gained by these units, which is, once again, an excellent bonus to gain on your backline units if you intend for them to counter enemy cavalry. And that's pretty much the same 
application as they would be on the Z Militia, so there is really not much to talk about it on these units. And we'll finally take a look at one unit we have not seen so far, the Imperial Gate Guards, because Imperial units are only available in the custom battles on He Jin. So here we see a unit with cape, very cool armor, very very strong, and the most comparable unit that we can take a look at is once again the Protector of Heaven. So we see 56, and actually let's just hit the compare button. So taking a look, exact same morale, exact same health, slightly higher charge. The 164 is on the Imperial Gate Guards, they're the left side stats. They have less attack rate, much less, less attack base damage, less armor piercing damage. So even though they have a higher charge bonus, they deal less damage. They have higher evasion, so they're better trained. And in addition to that, if you have more than one such unit, we mentioned this last time in our blue unit tier list, they gain a bonus for having an Imperial passive bonus for having more than one Imperial unit within their 50 meter range. And that is extra 10 points of morale, extra 10 points of melee evasion, and extra 10 points of melee damage armor piercing plus immune to terror, which is already on some of these units, but we don't mind that. Just notice that they will get 10 more points of uh, extra damage on their armor piercing damage, which will make them go higher than the Protector of Heaven, but because they have such lower attack speed, it's actually not as good. But their advantage in melee evasion will obviously expand from the current 13% to 23%. Same exact armor, slightly faster speed, same exact range block chance being nimble to dodge arrows at 35% even without shield. And that means these two units are very comparable. And because they're very comparable, we kind of need to talk about them to see what else separate these two units as their in-game combat or in-battle combat is rather similar. Well, to kick things off, the way you gain access to Imperial Gate Guard is you need six reforms in the green tree on the same exact reform that unlocks Azor Dragons. But whereas the Azor Dragon will become unlocked right away, the Imperial Gate Guards require you to also be an Emperor. So that means even if you rush for this reform, which will take you roughly 27 turns, or 28 turns if you start from turn 1, and sometimes even faster if you start out with the green tree, so potentially 23 turns, you could get access to Azor Dragons, you can't gain access to Imperial Gate Guards in the same amount of time unless you somehow reach the King rank by that time, which is near impossible. Now they do have a pro, is that when you recruit these units, even though they're slightly more expensive than Protector of Heaven, they come at rank 10. So Imperial units become hired at rank 10, whereas all other units start out rank 1. So because they will be a higher rank, their stats will all increase by a little bit. But the counterpart to that is Imperial units take forever to replenish, as there is a huge penalty to replenishment on these units. There's a few ways to bypass that for the initial recruitment, as you could use a swap technique to use one of your fully health units to swap into them for a little bit of extra cost, but it will save you a lot of time in mustering. The problem with that is most of your polearm units are frontline units, therefore they are expected to take some casualty in battle, and for all future replenishment, these units will have quite low replenishment, whereas the Protector of Heavens will actually have the normal replenishment. Now of course you could also argue Protector of Heaven also requires you to become an Emperor to unlock, but then you don't need the reform. So you can never advance in the green reforms and still have access to Protector of Heavens once you become Emperor, whereas you need both requirements for the Imperial Gate Guard. And then finally, for a last bit of showcase, just so that we have all grounds covered, we'll also take a quick look at the units that commanders can recruit, as commanders have two exclusive rights to units such as Spear Guard and Z Infantry for some reason in the game. And I have to say, there's nothing special about commander commanding these polearm units. You don't get the extra armor, you don't get the charge negation, which both are very useful for polearm units as they tend to counter either range or cavalry or both. What you do have is the same mobility, as they also have the mobility skill as the champion. So nothing too special here. Uh, 
you pretty much want to know that they have access to spear guards and see infantry and that's the only two things special about commanders here and that's going to wrap up our overview of these 10 poarm units in the game as we jump back to the tier list to give them a proper ranking Alrighty, so armed with all that analysis, we can begin our ranking, but before we start, there are still a few disclaimers. First, these rankings are obviously my opinion, based on my experience with single-player romance campaigns on Legendary Difficulty. And second, all the stats and figures from our analysis earlier were on large unit size on patch 1.6.1, so please adjust accordingly if you happen to play on a different unit size or on a later patch. And with that out of the way, let's start ranking these. Starting with Azor Dragons, why not, since they're right up here. I think Azor Dragons in the game are A tier units. And we have to caveat that with using Azor Dragons on either a commander, a sentinel, or a strategist. And the reason why is they can gain access to fire arrows, which is actually a huge difference as fire arrows provide more morale shock and more utility as it will help you destroy structures. Of those three classes, I believe sentinels are the best because you can also get charge negation on them, which only make your polearm units so much better against enemy cavalry. So we're going to put them in the A rank. They're not in the S tier, because of their dual weapon nature, they're not really specialized for either. And the investment of six screen reforms is not often the best thing in any given campaign. So that's going to hold this unit back from being S tier, although their bow damage is great. Then we have the heavy D infantry here. Now this unit is going to get a C tier rating from us. You can only recruit these on champions, which means we can add the 10% default onto their armor, making them a 63% armor unit, which despite their lack of range block chance, makes them okay against archer units. Now, of course, if your opponents are fielding crossbows, you're still in trouble, but they're strong. They're a sturdy unit on the front line, and they serve the purpose of anti-cavalry. And unlike the heavy variations of most range units where you don't need them to be in combat, you do need your polearm unit to be in combat sometime to hold the front line. And these heavy variants are going to be better than their non-armor variants. So they're going to be C. Now I understand C is still quite low, but there's reasons to that, as you would still need four reforms to unlock these, and the reforms for D infantry are really, really bad. If you think Azor Dragon reforms are tough, the Z Infantry line requires you to build some brain storage, which is a terrible building in the game. So that's going to hold them back by quite a bit. And you can pretty much use other units to replace their function, which is why they're going to be just a C tier unit here. Then we have the Heavy Spear Guards, and these are going to be S tier up here. And the reason is they function in both roles that polearm units are designed for. They are anti-range and anti-cavalry because of their huge shield. Now something does hold them back in that they don't have great armor stats and they also Now despite the fact that I'm going to place them in the godly S tier, they do have weaknesses. Most of their extra armor and extra evasion are based on their shield. So if the enemy have axe infantry and they engage you with those, you become rather poorly armored and rather exposed. And in addition to that, only champions have access to these units. Therefore, you are rather restricted to what type of army composition you can have. And there's the additional restriction of rank as you need to be rank six to recruit these units. So they're rather late game units. But if you have access to them in the late game and you are using champion army, they're definitely S tier in that case. Now let's just continue the S tier while we're here and tell you guys what the best unit in the game is. And that is without a doubt, Protector of Heavens as it will take our top spot even in the S tier. And the reason why for these unit is they are just the strongest unit in the game for pole arm. We already seen how much armor they have, how much evasion they have, how much charge they have, how fast they hit, how much damage they deal, and how easy you can gain access to them just by becoming king ranked with no investment in reform. 
because there's a lot of time where you don't want to invest in the green reforms at all and having these units available to you once you hit king on all your generals without any rank restriction without any reform restriction and the fact that they're cheaper than imperial units with regular replenishment just make them the best pull arm unit in the game they also have 35 percent range block chance even though they don't have any shield and they have extremely high armor to bounce those pesky arrows off making them very strong both as a front line as a flank protection as a charging infantry as an anti-cavalry they can do it all and you can pretty much spam these units in the mid to late game for a big advantage in all your armies then their counterpart the imperial variation is going to get a d tier rating from us i know we are punishing a lot of imperial units quite a bit but in all honesty the imperial Pole arm unit here, the Imperial Gate Guards, are not the Imperial unit you want to recruit. They don't perform as well as the Zora Dragons, they cost more, they require more reform investment, and they can't replenish as fast. So they're a bunch of headaches without any benefits. Therefore, they're going to become D tier because you don't want to invest in them. If you have the money, if you have the necessary requirement to get them, you would always want Protector of Heavens in all cases. Therefore, there is no place for them in the game, thus they will be D tier. Even though they will outperform all of the other units on this list, they're just not worth your time or investment simply because Protector of Heaven exists. Then moving on, we have these Z infantry. They're the medium tier. And they're going to join our friend here in the D tier because there's also no place for them, even though two different classes of general have access to them in the commander and the champions because they don't fit any roles unlike their heavier variant which would perform better both in melee and against range they don't do either well and they're more expensive and require reforms compared to their g militia counterpart which we might as well rank right now let's put them into the b tier and the reason why the Z Militia get such a high tier rating is because they're available to you from the start of the game on all generals requires nothing and they do one thing really well. They trade very well into enemy cavalry, as you can use them to trade for value against strong cavalry by having them on your flank. They're not great on the front, but they're very good on the flank, and you can use them as a cost-saving method against enemy cavalry unit. And if you have to get into a melee combat, they're not terrible. They do the exact same damage as the heavy Z infantry, and the Z infantry. Therefore, they're rated higher than both. So they're going to be our B tier unit. Then rounding out our A tier unit here, we have the Spear Guard, which comes at no surprise, I hope, because they are going to be a great early game unit for you to have. All three of them are mid to late game. Reform investment, King rank reinvestment, rank six investment, so the best unit you can utilize as a pull arm unit in the early game is the spear guard and add on the fact that you have them available for both champions and commanders they're quite flexible and they can do their job well holding down the front and holding down the flank against both range and cavalry unit then we have two more units here the peasant band and the spear warriors peasant bands are going to be d tier they're simply way too fragile to be utilized and even though they're cheap i don't know if you want to ever spend a retinue slot to recruit these because they have great armor piercing damage sure they have terrible charge terrible armor terrible evasion super fragile very low morale they're going to shatter before they can do anything one volley of arrow come down and these units are gone whereas their slightly upgraded counterpart the spear warrior here is actually going to be able to get a nice C tier ranking from us as they're going to be much more useful compared to their peasant band but not as useful as the Z militia as you still need to invest a little bit of reforms here two reforms to unlock them and once you unlock them they have the same armor setup as the regular Z infantry and the heavy spear guards minus the shield um, so they're not that bad and they have a pretty high charge bonus. So if you want to use these as flanking infantry that can 
come in in place of certain cavalry units, which I don't know why you would do that, but in case you're playing a game where you don't have cavalry and you have these, and sometimes you have these in retinue garrisons, like sometimes the garrison come with spear warriors and they're not bad. You want to flank with these. They're good in terms of their charge bonus and their high damage. 41 armor piercing damage is no joke. So there is a place for you to use them, but I find it hard to actually invest in an army of these. Whereas most of the time, my pole arm units are designed to be just counter cavalry or counter range. So that's going to wrap up our tier list here. Just be mindful, some of these rankings does reflect on certain general classes. For example, Azure Dragon is not as good on a champion versus a sentinel because the fire arrows. So just be a little bit mindful from our analysis of which type of classes have access to which type of skills on these units when you consider these rankings. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this one and we'll come back next time with our purple infantry as we round up the infantry before moving on to the cavalry for the red and yellow. So until then, bye!